Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Deaths from COVID-19 hit double digits this week in Indiana. For every single Hoosier has, that has lost, lost their life, there is a family, friends, and or community out there that is grieving their loss. Hoosiers are staying in for at least the next couple of weeks to try to slow the spread of the virus. So stay home. Get groceries only when you need them and only buy what you need. I'm telling you, the next two weeks are critical. Plus, we'll introduce you to a group of quilters who is answering the call to make protective face masks for healthcare workers. I love to sew. That's my superpower. And I believe in using superpowers for good. Those stories and more right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Well, more than a fifth of the world's population has been asked or ordered to stay home as coronavirus infections soar. This week, Indiana joined the list of states locking down. The governor ordered everyone to stay home unless they are conducting essential business. Brandon Smith reports. As part of the order, Holcomb is reducing state government staffing to only what he calls absolute essential levels. And he says that means all non-essential state business that has to be conducted in person will have to wait. Citizens shouldn't worry. This means all types of licenses issued by the state will automatically be extended by 60 days. Administration guidance says essential business and services allowed under the order include, but are not limited to, grocery stores, pharmacies, gas stations, police stations, fire stations, hospitals, doctor's offices, healthcare facilities, garbage pickup, public transit, and public service hotlines. Restaurants and bars will remain open too, but only to offer carry out and delivery, not in-person dining. The Holcomb administration says state police and local law enforcement will help enforce the order, but people won't be stopped driving to work or going for a walk. Outdoor recreation is still allowed under the stay-at-home order, though the state urges people to observe the six-foot social distancing guideline. So stay home. Get groceries only when you need them and only buy what you need. I'm telling you, the next two weeks are critical. Holcomb's order runs through April 6th, but the governor has said it could be extended. Our State House reporter Brandon Smith joins us now from Indianapolis. Brandon, you've talked to Holcomb several times this week, though he's not calling this a shelter in place as other states are. No, although that's really a semantic difference, not an actual one. These orders, while being called something different by some of our neighboring states, for instance, do the same thing, which is you should stay at home unless you need to be out. And there is, in Indiana, for instance, a long list of what counts as essential businesses or services. And as we heard, the governor is encouraging people to go outside for outdoor recreation while still observing those six-foot social distancing guidelines. You know, some of those things you're still allowed to do, like buying a car is one example. You wonder if there's just some confusion about how essential some of these things are. Has the governor faced questions about why his order doesn't go further? Yeah, we asked that very question yesterday, which is, is this so broad that it becomes ineffective? But so far, the governor says he's encouraged by how, it, uh, how it's working. He said the proof is in the pudding. For instance, if you look at traffic patterns, and, and I've been going to the State House every day this week, and there has been a, a huge decrease in the traffic I've faced. But for right now, he's encouraged by the process, the progress he's seeing. We won't actually see any reflection, though, in the data in terms of the spread of cases for at least a couple of weeks, because that's how the virus works. 
And then is this being enforced and what happens if people don't follow the stay at home order? That's the million dollar question. Yes, this is being enforced, we think, which is state and local police are responsible for enforcing the stay at home order. But as was said in, this, in the piece, you know, they are not gonna be pulling people over. That's not the guidance that the state police has issued to local police who are gonna be participating in enforcement here. And we asked the governor too, like, what happens if, for instance, I work at a business that I don't think is essential and I, I think we should be closed, but my boss is telling me to come in? Well, he's saying talk with your employer, and if you're still meeting a roadblock there and you really don't think you should be going in or that your company should be open, file a complaint with the Indiana Occupational Safety and Health Administration. But in terms of what happens then, we just don't know. Okay, Brandon, thank you very much. We'll continue to get updates, I'm sure, from you throughout the State House this coming week. Indiana health officials aren't providing details on hospital capacity around the state as its number of confirmed coronavirus related illnesses continues to quickly grow. In a week, the number of positive cases increased by more than 900 and the state's death toll went up by more than 20 in the past week. State Health Commissioner Dr. Christina Bach says state officials will not release information provided by hospitals about their intensive care unit capacity and equipment availability. What I asked for was basic ICU beds and basic ventilators, but because everybody's stepping up to the plate and trying to pretty much double their ICU capacity, I'm seeing those numbers increase as we go along. Anticipating a shortage, leaders in some other states have been vocal about how many ventilators they have, how many they need, and how many they have requested from the federal government's strategic national stockpile. Now, Chris Bach says the information about the state's hospital's ventilation supply is confidential. And Governor Holcomb came out with another executive order yesterday to try to slow the spread of the coronavirus. As part of the order, Hoosiers with chronic health conditions will be able to receive 90-day supplies of non-controlled prescription med medications like insulin. So if you're wondering how to extend your prescriptions as you shelter in place, Mitch Legan reports on the best ways to do so. Governor Eric Holcomb's order for Hoosiers to shelter in place has radically altered life across Indiana. As part of that social distancing strategy, health officials are encouraging Americans to load up on prescription medication to last them for what could be months. We're being told to make sure we have anywhere from a month to a couple of months of a prescription that is very necessary. But at the same time, people feel uncertainty about what the rules are about whether they can get access to these medications. That was Jan Davis's concern. She's 67 and lives in Indianapolis with her husband. She says she's all set now, so I caught up with her over FaceTime to see how she managed to increase her supply. Well, um, we're doing what everyone else is doing. We're staying home. Uh, both of us are over 65, so um, we are not going to the store any more than we have to. One of the first things Davis did was check which prescriptions were getting low. I know last year when we went to Florida, we are on Medicare and we wanted to get our prescriptions ahead of time before we, because we were there for a few months and they told us we could not do that. The good news is that many insurance companies are lifting some of those barriers. The American Pharmacists Association has encouraged them to do so and the trade association America's Health Insurance Plans has a list on its website of which insurance companies are doing what. Even if you thought in the past that your insurance was not going to cover a 90 day fill, they now many are so you should go and, and not let that be a barrier. The type of medicine you're prescribed will determine what kind of extension you can get, if any. Even with insurance companies lifting restrictions, your more controlled substances will still carry 30 day caps. If your prescription has a limit, President-elect of the Indiana Pharmacist Association, Lynn Toma, says you could try asking your insurance company to override that restriction. And if that can't happen, mail order or delivery could be alternatives. Mail order would be an actual package that's coming in the mail. And that's going to take um, a little bit more time for that to arrive because you, know, you get to put the order in, the pharmacy has to prepare it, and then mail it out. Whereas delivery, all the pharmacy... Um, they could fill your prescription and then deliver it out to your home that day. She says if you still have to go to the pharmacy to fill your prescription, using the drive through or curbside pickup can help keep you and pharmacy workers safe. For those who might have trouble paying for the extended prescriptions or don't have health insurance at all, Thomas says many pharmacies have lists of generic drugs at lower prices. Utilize those, those coupons when applicable. Um, a lot of our pharmacies have $4 lists um, for 
30 day prescriptions, $10 for 90 days. Um, so, you know, utilizing those resources. Simon says keeping on top of your prescriptions is not only important for your own health, but also helps keep pressure off the health care system during this uncertain time. If people are not maintaining their maintenance medications, then they're at risk of needing to go to need emergency care, and that's just going to tax the system even more. Health workers encourage those with prescriptions to get just enough to hold them over so pharmacies don't run into supply issues down the road. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Mitch Legan. Now, IU Health is asking people who think they could have symptoms of the coronavirus to use a virtual app to get screened. The IU Health Service is free and designed to help the hospital see more patients, as well as reduce the potential for spreading the virus. Here's a look at how the virtual screening app works. First-time users download the app and create a login. They're then asked questions about why they're seeking treatment and then select a nurse to video chat with about their symptoms. Dan Handel is the chief medical officer for the Southern Central Region of IU Health. He says right now, if a user says they have not traveled outside the U.S. and haven't come into contact with someone who tested positive, they're screened as negative for the virus. I think the app provides some evidence-based reassurance. Um, that they're, they're most likely okay, and it's, it's probably best for them to stay at home as opposed to trying to go out and get further testing. Handel says based on user symptoms, the app will advise on whether to seek further treatment. The app results change to reflect the CDC's latest recommendations. Handel says the screening service is restricted to Indiana residents only. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Emma Atkinson. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Indiana's medical device industry is recognized nationally, so how are companies here helping with the coronavirus pandemic? And dozens of Hoosiers are helping ease the shortage of masks by making them while they're hunkered down at home. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU news team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU News Team is where you are and telling your story. In a time of change, where can you find in-depth reporting and thoughtful analysis? Washington Week on PBS. Join moderator Robert Costa. When I was at the Capitol this week, I encountered the same... And a panel of award-winning journalists. You're seeing a divided nation and you're seeing... For insights and perspective. Tonight there was a key development in the You Senate won't find anywhere else. What a week. Washington Week. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. The coronavirus is putting a strain on healthcare systems everywhere as COVID-19 spreads and hospitals around the world request more life-saving equipment. Medical device companies such as Bloomington-based Cook Medical are hurrying to meet demand. Reporter Mitch Legan spoke with Cook Group President Pete Yalkman over a Zoom video call to see what the company is doing to help combat the coronavirus. More generally, how has, you know, this coronavirus, um, how has it uh, impacted Cook the last couple of months? We've been following this since early December of last year. Uh, we've been able to maintain our supply chain. Uh, you know, one of the things that's really important and sometimes people forget is that people focus on hospitals a lot. And it's, of course, that's extremely important, but they can't do the job if they don't have the tools. And so what we do is make the tools for physicians and people who are on the front lines of this battle. And so we really worked very hard to make sure that we maintain our uh, manufacturing and distribution capabilities, because if we can't get our products to hospitals, uh, patients can't be treated. I saw last night that I think it was the GM plant in Kokomo had said that they would take a look at possibly creating ventilators or anything like that. My question for you is, you know, kind of along the same lines. Do you have the ability to, I guess, switch production to things like ventilators or stuff like that? So we probably are not equipped to make something like a ventilator. That's a very complex machine, very complex supply chain. There are probably better, so we're better situated to do that. But there are some unique capabilities and, and resources and skills that we have as a company that nobody else does. For example, we're looking at a program with uh, IU Health and looking to see can we use our sterilization capabilities to be able to take masks, the N95 masks that have been used or surgical masks and re-sterilize them 
so they can be used again because there's been a lot of shortage of these masks. Uh, but one of our core functions and our core capabilities is doing sterilization of products, as you can imagine, because our products need to go into a sterile environment. What would that look like if you end up going uh, going with the mask sterilization sort of thing? And wh what would it look like and when would that start? So it, just to give you an example of how quickly this thing is moving. Uh, we went from the idea of could we re-sterilize masks to testing them and to putting in place a procedure in less than 24 hours. In a normal time, that might take more than a year. Uh, but our teams are moving so quickly in coordination with IU Health. Now, we're still in testing. We don't know exactly if this is going to work or not. But if it does, it will allow the healthcare system to greatly extend their use of masks and, and protective devices. So we think that's a great match of our skills and then the need in the community in a way that we can help give back uh, for the people who are trying to uh, provide care on the front lines. Governor Holcomb comes out with this uh, shelter-in-place order. Yeah. How will this shelter-in-place well, order affect Cook, I guess, specifically in Indiana? More than half of our global workforce is here in Indiana. And so the ability for us to deliver products to patients across the world depends on the people here in Indiana. Uh, so we have some, what we've done is we've taken a critical look at our infrastructure and said, there are certain aspects that we need to maintain for sure. That includes manufacturing and distribution, because we ship out from this from Indiana to all over the world. Uh, so we want to make sure that stays intact uh, and, and is robust. So anybody who has been in a, who is at a facility where one of those functions takes place, manufacturing distribution, we've asked anybody who is not critical to that function to work from home. Are you changing uh, any policies, you know, to make sure that, you know, your workers can make it financially during this uncertain time? So we've done things like having people work from home uh, if they can. And that has been going surprisingly well. Uh, better than we have expected it to go. The other thing we're doing is making sure that for those people who really are critical to making products, we want to make sure our environment's as safe as it can be. And then what we're trying to do is identify policies that help people figure out how to adjust their schedule. So we put in place almost a 24-7 schedule that allow people to pick shifts depending on what their needs are for childcare or for uh, caregiving in some way. So we're really trying to be as flexible as we can. Yachman says Cook has been able to maintain its supply chain and is operating at about 95 to 97 percent capacity in terms of its ability to do business. He says there haven't been any disruptions so far, but things could get more difficult as more places enact different restrictions, quarantines and shutdowns. A shortage of medical supplies is making the coronavirus crisis worse. There aren't enough gloves, gowns and face masks. Hospitals and medical facilities throughout the country are asking people for help. As Sarah Whitmire reports, groups are answering the call and making masks to donate. What title would you like to go by? Quilter. Quilter? Oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> Nola Hartman had a lot of the materials already on hand when she got the first call. A week ago Sunday, I got a call from a friend who said, my mother is a pediatrician in southern Indiana and she needs masks. Can you help? And so since then, I, we're, we're at 119 volunteers now. Yeah, so um, the, the first week it was pretty much just me. Things were kind of quiet and then demand just exploded. And that's when I went online and made a plea for help. Kelly Clark came on board too. She's in charge of all the organizational stuff, registering volunteers, taking them supplies, picking up finished masks, washing and sorting them, and then delivering them to folks who've placed orders. In the medical world, when you are doing procedures like surgeries and stuff like that, um, there are clean procedures, okay? And obviously I cannot come close to duplicating true surgical clean procedures. Mm -hmm but I have enough knowledge of how they work that I can handle these masks um, as cleanly as can be expected mm -hmm. uh, and reduce the risk of contamination. The very first step in opening any of these boxes, yeah, yeah, yeah the very first step. The quality of these masks is not as good as what they use in hospitals, but they help add to the overall supply of masks, which is important. Because of the shortage, N95 mask orders that do get filled get channeled straight to hospitals. Because I know that these fabric masks are desperately needed by our um, secondary health care providers, largely to free up supply for our frontline health care uh, providers of the medical grade protective equipment. 
It takes Nola about 10 minutes to make one. So the first thing we start with is an 8 by 16 rectangle of fabric. Then we have a slightly smaller piece of non-woven fabric. We're using interfacing. She doesn't know how many she's made, but even with her work and what the team of volunteers is doing, they can't keep up with the orders. Well, my goal today is to get, oh, I think, 50 more of these mm -hmm. into bags for Middleway House and then 20 more for their volunteers, mm -hmm. and then they'll be ready to drop off. Nola and Kelly are working at least 12-hour days, and they say they'll continue doing it as long as there's a demand. I love to sew. That's my superpower, and I believe in using superpowers for good. So when I saw a need, I was really happy to be, be able to find something that I could do to help. We're gonna be BFF, so <laughs> yeah, perfect. Yeah. You and I are gonna go out and have a nice meal and a drink when it's over. And I'm gonna give you the squishiest hug ever. I know. <laughs> but I can. There are so many delayed hugs involved in this. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Sarah Whitmire. And it's impossible to practice social distancing at a crowded concert, for example, or a basketball game, or even at the starting line of a foot race. When organizers canceled the Indy Mini Marathon, thousands of runners were undoubtedly disappointed, particularly the handful of folks who have run it every race since it started nearly 50 years ago. Adam Pinsker has the story. It's a tradition that's spanned five decades, but on May the 2nd, the streets of Indianapolis will be quiet. The Indy Mini Marathon scheduled for that day is canceled because of the coronavirus. I'm certainly disappointed. Mike Vollmer of Indianapolis is one of six people who has run in every mini marathon since the event started in 1977. For him, running is part of his lifestyle. I started doing it because it, it, was, it could be a, a pretty much a year-round general health and fitness. Uh, weight control, stress uh, control, um, you know, psychological well-being, things like that. Um, so that has, it served me well. The Indy Mini Marathon is one of the largest and longest running races in the country, drawing runners from not just Indiana and the rest of the country, but overseas as well. Last year, 24,000 runners, walkers, and people in wheelchairs participated in either the Mini Marathon or the 5K. It isn't just the mini marathon that's been canceled. A number of other events leading up to the race, including the big kickoff event, as well as educational programs for kids, also canceled because of COVID-19. We recognize that there's uh, much more significant hardship that's going on right now, and we just want to be as supportive as we possibly can. Brian says the planning for each year's mini marathon begins almost immediately after the previous year's race ends. Race organizers have already paid for many of the expenses for this year's race. You start ordering shirts and medals, you start warehousing product, um, you start uh, contracts with a lot of vendors, whether it's for uh, start finish line, um, uh, bike rack, Portageon, security personnel. That means no refunds will be issued to runners who have already signed up and paid their registration fees. Runners will have the option of using this year's fees for next year's race or donating the entry fees to some of the nonprofit educational organizations the festival supports. You have an opportunity now through the end of June to get out either whether it's a treadmill in your house or whether it's uh, out in your in your neighborhood outside. Um, to mark off that distance and complete your 5K or your half marathon challenge, and we will mail you your medal. This is the medal for the first. Vollmer says he plans to do the virtual race, but he'll miss the camaraderie and supportive atmosphere that just can't be replicated running alone or at a small group. Social distancing could not have happened in those races because throughout the entire race, you could run, unless you were at the front of the pack, and reach out and touch someone all around you. The only thing that changed was the color of the t-shirt. Vollmer has a treasure trove of race paraphernalia, including a certificate and a medal from the very first Indy Mini Marathon 44 years ago, a day he remembers clearly. The first two years, both of them were 90 degrees at race time and full sun and about 80% humidity. So they were just 
really miserable. But while bad weather, injuries, or family events weren't enough to keep Vollmer from partaking in this May tradition, it took a pandemic to keep him at home. Vollmer says the 500 Festival and the Races Alumni Club have kept the official statistics on individuals who have run the most consecutive races. He's still unsure how an act of God like the coronavirus will affect the record keeping. Whether they designate that as the street continuing or not uh, is really not for me to say. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Adam Pinsker. Before we end tonight, we want to hear from you. How are you adjusting to the governor's stay at home order? What suggestions do you have for helping others and doing good for your community during this during this stressful time? You can share your ideas at WTIUnews.org and we might reach out to you for a story. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we bring you new information about the coronavirus in Indiana 24-7. Remember, you can read our latest stories at WTIUnews.org. Stay safe and have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.